I'm Rhiannon McRae. I'm the editor for Trends in Genetics. I'm here with Joop Decker, who's at the UMass Medical School. And I'm just going to ask him a few questions about his work, which is largely about sort of the, the genome in 3D. Um, but I heard earlier today that you actually got your start doing NMR spectroscopy. So I'm just curious how you <laughs> moved from sort of structural biochemistry to looking at genome organization. I didn't really actually work on NMR. I, I worked with people who did the NMR. I was the biochemist who was purifying proteins. Uh, but yes, I was very much trained in the history of studying the three-dimensional structure of molecules, proteins in the beginning. And I took that idea of structural studies uh, to uh, chromosomes when I joined the lab of Nancy Fleckner uh, many years ago. Um, and, and, and at the time, I really had a similar idea to take biochemical approaches to study chromosome structure. Um, very much like one, what would people do in NMR is to see along a protein chain which atoms lie near each other. And if you would know that for every amino acid or every atom, you can learn about the protein structure. So I had this, at the time, rather naive idea that is, if I can do the same thing for a chromosome and see for every locus on the chromosome what it is close to along that chromosome, I can learn something about folding. It was a crazy idea at the time. It worked out quite well. So this is the 3C or some some variety of the 3C technique? Yes, that, okay. that concept was, was what inspired me to develop a method that's now widely used as chromosome confirmation capture okay. on 3C. That's the 3C, yeah. So could you just describe kind of generically how that method works and how it has since been adapted so now there's 4C, 5C, high C? There's a whole family of C methods right now. The basic concept really is the same for all of them. And that is, if you have a three-dimensional structure of a chromosome, there will be all kinds of loci that are physically touching or very be very near other loci. And what we're really doing in this experiment is fixing that structure, fixing all those interactions, and then cutting up the DNA in small pieces. Things that were close to each other in 3D will, will continue to be linked to each other, and we re-ligate them to make a ligation product. That ligation product tells us that these two loci were in three-dimensional close spatial proximity. And then we just have to interrogate that sample that comes out of that experiment. Mm -hmm. um, we can do a PCR reaction. You can These days you deep sequence everything, yeah, yeah. which is what ultimately led to the high C yeah. method or 3C seq or, or any, anything like that, where basically you end up with a contact map for the whole genome. Mm -hmm. And you can see for every locus what it is close to in three-dimensional space. Okay. So maybe this is a naive question, but anytime someone talks about, you know, thinking about chromatin, they always describe, you know, this huge expanse of linear DNA that's jammed into a really yes. tiny space. Yes. So if you jam that all into a little tiny space, obviously everything is going to be physically interact like, or touching or really near to it. So how do you sort out what's what maybe has a function versus what is just simply a result of packing? You, you put your finger on, on I think, a, the hard problem in this field, <laughs> and that is um, when we talk about spatial, close spatial proximity, they have to be really close to each other to cross-link. So it's not okay. that you cross-link everything to everything. Mm -hmm. But it is true when you make a contact map, and at this meeting we've seen examples of this, and we'll see more, I guess, mm -hmm. of contact maps, and everybody is talking to everybody. Um, and the big challenge has been for, for the last number of years, now that such maps have become available, to interpret them. How do we know what it means? And the first question we have to ask, what does it mean in terms of structure? What is even the structure? Yeah. And that is, we're learning that there are all kinds of levels of structures that we can deduce from them. Mm -hmm. The next question is what you just asked, and that is how can we find whether any of these structures is functional? Mm -hmm. And this is a really hard problem. <laughs> um, and, but one that I think that the field currently is, is, is on, the, on the edge of actually making tremendous breakthroughs. Um, because in order to assign function to a structure, you have to perturb the structure. Yeah. Um, and we can now do this. Uh, mm -hmm. We can now use genome editing tools to what we refer to as editing or, or engineering mm -hmm. the 3D genome. Okay. So we can try to alter it mm -hmm. and then use other genomic methods like RNA-seq, mm -hmm. for instance, to see how it affects mm -hmm. the function of a genome, which often is gene expression. Yeah. Genomes have yeah. other functions like chromosome segregation, mm -hmm. uh, but a lot of people are focusing on mm -hmm. gene expression. So. I think right now, this is an exciting time because if 3C and high C methods, we can actually make a three-dimensional map of the genome. We've heard beautiful talks already about mm -hmm. imaging at this meeting, yeah. where we can see the, 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 the 3D genome in live cells in real time. Mm -hmm. um, that combined with these genome editing tools, I think mm -hmm. we can really start to relate the structure mm -hmm. to, to the function.
Yes, and that's a challenge for the next couple of years. Yeah. So we've also already heard a number of talks that have talked about TADs. Yes. So it's are those TAD talks, I feel like this is like like a TED you talk. You stole my but thunder because talk. that's my title of my talk. <laughs> oh tonight. good, oh good. I hope you pace and wear you know the little <laughs> microphone like this. Um, so can you describe what a TAD is and what what are some of the kind of insights that have come out of of discovering these TADs? Yeah, the TADs. So these stand the, the term stands for topologically associating domains. They were really. This is how they were defined. They were defined in high C interaction maps as contiguous chromosomal regions where all the loci in that region mm -hmm. have an elevated interaction probability, as if they're all clustered in space. Okay. So, just roughly, like what kind of what kind of scale are we talking in terms of? In mammalian cells, these range from several hundred kilobase. Okay. But there are some very large ones. Some of them are several megabases in size. Okay. okay. Uh, in flies and, and and other organisms where people have found mm -hmm. them, they're smaller, like yeast. Do they so? Do they scale with genome size? They like stay, if you have a really large I, genome, I, I are you more likely that to they, have a yeah. large TAD? To TADs, I would think so. On the one hand, yes. In mammalian cells, TADs mm -hmm. are hundreds of kb to megabases. In flies, a much smaller genome, mm -hmm. yeah. they're like 60 kb. Okay. But so recently, maybe. we found, in collaboration with Barbara Meyer's lab at Berkeley, similar types of domains in C. elegans, mm -hmm. specifically in the doses compensated X chromosome. Now, the C. elegans genome is rather small, just like flies, mm -hmm. but the tats are the size of mammalian tats. Okay. They're mega okay. So these so could be a, different. Yeah. And this goes back to your first question, like, what is okay. a tad? I really don't know. I mean, these, these um, they are defined as structural units. Mm -hmm. They might be loops. Mm -hmm. Some people have found yeah. now that are, the ends of the domains interact to form a loop, and that could result in the formation of a compact mm -hmm. chromatin domain. And then everything in that domain would sort of make Every, up that tab. Everything inside of the, in that loop yeah. would interact frequently, and yeah. they would live inside the tab. Mm -hmm. um, but we now have these similar domains but in I, C. elegans, and they're back, different. Just going back, though, if it's really looped like that, then that also suggests that linearly, that all of those, you know, all, all of the genes or whatever else that's in that linear stretch of DNA, almost like an operon, right? That they may be somehow related, right. like if they're... That's right. Okay. Um, and that's a very good uh, point you raise. The prediction of these structures would be, if they are functional, mm -hmm. would predict that all the genes inside such mm -hmm. domains would be related. They probably share the same enhancers. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what we believe. Uh, the genes really live in a small neighborhood. Mm -hmm. They don't see most of the rest of the genome. They live inside this mm -hmm. TAD, communicate with the nearby enhancers. Mm -hmm. That would predict that all the genes in the TAD would be somehow correlated coordinated in their expression. That turns out to be the case in many many examples that we looked at. So okay. that would suggest that TADs are not only structural mm -hmm. uh, units of chromosomes, but functional domains. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is an idea that has huge impact beyond just the chromosome structure field. This goes far into uh, uh, human genetics, disease genetics, yeah. where um, uh, large efforts around the world are identifying elements that carry genetic variation linked to disease, often these regions are far from genes yep. and we can't find the gene. Using the TAD information can help you assign the target gene mm -hmm. that could potentially be affected by such a variant. Mm -hmm. And this has already been uh, done by many groups. And I think this is, this is why this type of information, it comes from just being interested in the structure yep. of a chromosome has direct impact on our understanding of, of uh, the causes of human disease. So that has been very satisfying for me to see that. So what you were kind of mentioned with human disease, so does that suggest that we have the same TADs? Are TADs conserved between, TADs are very, between individuals and between they're, they're, they're very species? conserved. Um, they are very conserved between individuals, be, even mm -hmm. between different cells in, in one individual, okay. and between different species. But there are interesting variations. Mm -hmm. um, you can imagine it's a very powerful, as you just described, it's a very powerful way of regulating genes. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it may not be surprising that the cell sometimes uses that to regulate genes. Can you imagine you have two TADs next to each other, and a gene lives in one TAD. Uh, it doesn't see the other regulatory elements, mm -hmm. but the cell can lift the boundary in between, mm -hmm. and suddenly it will expose that gene to a new stretch of the, of the genome, new regulatory elements, and, and sometimes it might be used uh, during development mm -hmm. to turn genes on or off. Um, there are several examples in the mm -hmm. Hox clusters where this could happen. Um, so it's, it's, it, is very, it is a universal architecture, 
but there are interesting there variations to it. So is there is there anything known about what happens to CAD structure during, say, genome reprogramming? Or so some of these, you know, if you're going to do, like, I was thinking of genome-wide demethylation or something yes. like this is kind of resetting. What happens to the TADs in those um, I don't know the answer to that question. But, for instance, what we do know is that when cells divide, mm -hmm. every time cells go through mitosis, yep. in mitosis, these, these TADs are not, not there. They're okay. disassembled. Yep. And then when the, the 3D genome reforms in early G1, they all reform. Mm -hmm. So this, what I just said, these stats are very stable between individuals, between you and me. Mm -hmm. uh, but every time one of our cells divides, it, it, the TAD turns over. Okay. So, so the cell has to constantly build and, and fold and unfold these yeah. TADs. I can imagine in, in reprogramming, uh, the, the very pluripotent state is also very fluid. Mm -hmm. And the, the TADs are there, but they seem to be weaker than in differentiated cells. We don't know what do you why. Mean by weaker? They just, the signature, more diffuse, maybe? they look more diffuse. They, okay. they, they look less separate from each other, as if okay. there's more, okay. more chances for mixing. Okay. As if the whole genome is kind of like still a little bit undecided uh -huh. as to how it's going to yeah. regulate its genes. Okay. Uh, but but um, really, we. I know several people are looking into this process of pluripotency versus differentiated and then reprogramming. Um, I, I, I'm currently not uh, familiar enough with the data okay. to know that, what the answer really is, but I wouldn't be surprised that, that there are some changes happening during that process. So one of the things you just said that you know the cell is constantly refolding these TADs after it you know, goes through mitosis, something kind of brought me back to where I asked you in the beginning about you know where you started with protein biochemistry and looking at how proteins fold. Yeah. So you know I think about the protein folding field. So one of the things that people are have been working on for a long time now is whether or not you can computationally predict yeah. the 3D structure just from the amino acid sequence. Yes. So can we predict TAD structure from the linear DNA? I mean, are there? Do you think that what's governing TAD formation is actually you know partly specified by the sequence, or is it maybe? Uh, we don't. Yeah, it certainly it, it would be a would be a very worthy goal to be able to predict the three dimensional structure of a genome, maybe not from its sequence, but from its linear epigenome. Okay. Um, so like like pattern of features, histone. Okay. It could be DNA methylation uh -huh. features, transcription Nucleosome patterns, nucleosomes, mm -hmm. um, and some things will be hardwired. We can deduce it from the DNA mm -hmm. sequence, but I think a lot of, the, I mean, three D genome structure, despite that the tests are universal. Other aspects of the structure are very self specific mm -hmm. so that's an epigenetic feature probably. Okay. Um, it would be great to be able to predict that. I mean, it would um, be great to predict protein structures. We're still uh, not very good at that. We're still not that. able to do that. <laughs> now, I agree. That would be great because it kind of would suggest we understand how it, how it works. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think we have, we now understood some of the rules. Mm -hmm. The problem is many of these rules were deduced from correlation studies, like when, when when this gene is on, it's there in the 3D genome, and it's off, it's there, so transcription must be important. Okay. Um, but that's not the right way to do it, I think. We have to, again, use approaches such as genome engineering to directly manipulate it mm -hmm. um, and, and, and see how we can alter things. Okay. Uh, Wendy Bigmore had a beautiful paper earlier, uh, a few months ago, uh, in Science, where she showed that local chromatin mm -hmm. state can reposition yeah. a locus yeah. in the nucleus, which I thought was a wonderful example of what type of information is being used to build three-dimensional chromosome structures? Well, maybe a little bit like uh, protein structures, no? where you can place a hydrophobic amino acid somewhere and it will end up in yep. the hydrophobic yep. core of the protein. Yep. Um, we have to learn these rules. Um, and again, as I pointed out earlier, I think the field is right poised now to, to start to ask these questions. And maybe maybe when you ask me in 10 years, <laughs> I, can, I can predict to you how, okay. how to follow 3D. I'll look genome. forward to that. So I have one last question that I want to ask. Do you remember, so so we're here at the, this is the symposia honoring the 150 years of Gregor Mendel's discoveries. So do you remember learning about Gregor Mendel's laws of inheritance yeah, or I doing do. a Punnett square? How, do you, like, were you? Yeah, I was probably <laughs> in high school somewhere. Uh, I do remember, I, I was very intrigued by genetics from the beginning. Uh, and what I like about it, in retrospect, it's so simple if you, once you know it, but but as uh, Ken Zara this morning pointed out, mm -hmm. if you just do that first cross and you don't know genetics, uh -huh. it's, it's, it's a mystery, magic. No? it's this magic. Yeah. Um, and it's wonderful that now we, we've learned some of the, uh, the details and the mechanisms, but I still think it's magic. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you.